Today we bring you Reconstructing Spirit Hill. Previously on Reconstructing Spirit Hill. I had very conflicting thoughts whenever I first took a look around at this place. I did not foresee it being salvageable. We had paid out half of the money that we had borrowed to fix up the house. And we didn't have really anything viable, like not livable. It was bad. We were in a spot. The house was in worse condition than whatever we bought it. Given all of the issues we were being faced with, Charlie made the recommendation that we go glamping. So we said our goodbyes to the apartment. It was a bit of a challenge and a journey getting everyone to consolidate, but we got settled. When you're sitting there for a year, trying to figure out how to get a project back on track, you just move your entire family into a camper on your property, but then to have basically a cavalry show, show up. up. exciting changes and challenges in the house and some drastic changes in our uh, personal lives. Holidays were a great time, but um, with the new year we had to get back to work and um, it was kind of like a rush to get dried in. The dry-in inspection is probably the most important inspection when you're building a house. So what is the rough-in? Explain the rough-in. Well, the, the dry-in. I'm sorry, dry-in. It's when you're dried in. So the, the dry-in inspection is when you, you have everything framed in and the exterior of the house is completely waterproofed so that everything is dried in. And the inspector needs to be able to come in and see everything from the inside when it's opened up so that he can make sure that your waterproofing is, uh, is working correctly. Um, so the, and he needs to be able to see the entire exterior before the siding is on. It's probably the biggest inspection when it comes to building a house. We were in a rush to get dried in because we wanted to move into the house as quickly as possible. And we actually did it in about two months. It was pretty quick. The, the biggest thing that you have to get correct with your dry in is your framing because it's the dry in inspection is also your framing inspection. When we brought in our engineer, one of the reasons why we brought him in is because the, um, the older uh, heart of pine timber that was originally in the house can actually handle a, a better load than the newer pine timber that you buy at the store today. And that's because they grow pine trees extremely quickly. So the, the timber that they use today is a softer timber than the, the true cut heart of pine that was originally in the house. And that, that original timber could actually hold a better load. So you don't have to have the exact spacing with your two by fours or your framing that you do with today's timber. And the only way that you can get around that correctly is with an engineer. Yeah, the inspector won't approve any of your work unless you have an engineer stamp off, sign off on it, saying that they have approved and checked the elements of it and that it is sound and safe. So we had to do that with the timber framing and then also with the foundation, we had to make sure that that was squared away and waterproofed and it was built correctly, it had the right footing under it and everything, but the, the there was no anchor system to anchor the house to the foundation, so it was... Creative, but yeah. doable. And then we also, we got to do 
something that I was super excited for. I think we've, we were all really antsy about getting the back corner um, demoed. So they basically took sawzaws and Three, cut through all two, the timbers on the um, back side and then they, they like just pushed it off with sticks and just crashed off the house. That was fun to watch. previous extension that they had, an add-on that they had done. It was like an exterior hallway that they... It was I a don't know porch they that they had closed into a hallway. So the framing was horrible. It was rotted. It was pretty much falling off the house. Yeah, and that's what, where we had also decided to cantilever and extend the uh, house a little bit. So whatever, as soon as we could demo that was when we could put new foundation there and we could proceed with actually really working out, carving out the ideas that we have for the interior of the home. Good morning, it's a very foggy morning today. We are at an exciting point. We finally have been able to demo the back quarter of the house that needed the demo and are able to pour foundation. So, if you will look, there are spaces now, yay, for new footings and foundation pieces, and that's very exciting. So, we are on to the next phase. Something else we needed to address while the walls were exposed and we were working out all of the angles was the chimneys. They are constructed of not your typical brick and mortar. They are brick and clay mortar-ish something or other. Basically whatever they would have had around in the late 1800s, early 1900s. While we felt like it was extremely sturdy, we didn't know because it's a dual their dual sided fireplace. We didn't know if we should if we had multiple flues, if we if they were working, if there were things living in there. You know what was going on. So we had to get an inspection done on our chimneys. Part of the problem is that the pitch of this house, and this is how we were able to add the second floor, but it goes up real high because we're down in the south, and the heat needs to be able to go up high to escape. So the fireplaces, they have to go way up above the roof lines. So they were extending way, way up above where the roof was and they weathered over time. Pieces well, were crumbling off. Yeah, well the structure was solid here. Up there, there were like holes in it and stuff and it was very exactly. shady. And we had come to the conclusion to bring them down to a safer level up top because we wanted to keep them and then uh, cap them off so that we could if we wanted to, at a later time, um, address utilizing them in a traditional sense, like wood burning fireplace. But um, for the time being, it was just more cost effective for us to cap them and still have them to be able to utilize with the uh, natural gas. Quite a fun process. I don't think I would ever want to be up on the chimney dealing with bricks like that because... Uh, just on, on the roof period, this is a pretty steep slope, so I wouldn't want to be up there fiddling around. But. If we get a lot of snow, it might be fun on the snowboard, but... Don't do that. The house's walls were also not very uh, true. They were kind of like leaning out in some oh. areas. Um, <laughs> and so 
like our front porch. I had tried to fix the front porch. It, the, the box beam and everything was falling off. What we're doing here is a uh, repair to our front porch. But the more we got into it, we realized that the whole front wall of the house was just kind of leaning out. And you could actually see like a, a couple inches gap at the top as it went up. We had another issue with the, the back wall of the house doing the same thing where they were just kind of slowly falling away. So they actually got, you know, wires and chains and I think they used come-alongs to kind of like jack the house walls back into place and get them as straight as they possibly could. Mm -hmm. And while they were doing that, they went ahead and uh, correctly fixed the front porch. My method of fixing it was um, a, little well, a little hodgepodge. I was, it, it, it was originally a box beam. When I jacked this thing up and pulled the post out, is that this box beam here is actually rotted apart in about a four foot section. Uh, the way they do it now is uh, with two by tens, two of them put together is a lot more sturdy than what I was trying to do. Their method of uh, bracing the front porch roof was also a lot more sturdy than what I was trying to do. I used car jacks to jack it up. Um, As you can see at the far left side, I installed a, um, a jack and then I used a car jack here to actually uh, jack up. Um, I'm going to show you here in just a second why that's a bad idea. But so that was kind of that was exciting for me because that front porch I was afraid was going to fall on somebody and when they fall they kind of like flat back against the house and, and if that happened that whole front wall probably would have just... It's a good thing you bit. didn't tell me these things then. <laughs> Again, with the basic level that we were at, we also had to address things like the siding situation, where we wanted to put stairs, um, where we were going to do HVAC, and then how to fix the floor. We kind of patchworked that. We put some, um, was it plywood? Pit, you know, hodgepodge. What yeah, the well, floors that existed. We used the old set floors, and then we came in and patched in with. The, the plywood subfloor that you, you see today in the areas where the old floor wasn't. So we really wanted to keep as much of the old house here as possible. And it did create a little bit of crickettiness every now and then in the floors when you walk on it, but that- That's part of the- it's part of the old house. Of the yeah. house. Yeah, so, and then the stairs were tricky because with it being so open, you could really make it, I mean, whatever the heck you wanted to in this house, but I, we both wanted to keep with what we had seen fundamentally when we came in. There weren't stairs. There was a pull string with a little like ladder thing that falls down and a huge fan to suck all of the hot air to the attic. So we could place it wherever we really wanted to and I didn't want to put it to where, I don't know, there were a lot of elements that I considered whenever we were talking about where to put the stairs, but ultimately where it wound up being was perfect. It was a little bit more of a feat than anticipated because of the regulations. Like, did you know that a stair has to be, how many inches is it? I think it's about four inches at its narrowest point, so. So if you're turning your stairs or creating any kind of situation like that in order to be in current code, at least where we live, I don't know if that's everywhere, but you have to have a minimum of four inches on your the flat plane of your stair, which caused a bit of a issue where I wanted to turn it, so. It caused an issue for the contractor in general because we did have to make sure that the stairs went up at a, at a good point where we could have the headroom going up the stairs. Then the stairs have to be at a certain height and depth for each step. And they don't allow it to be very steep, so we had to use more space than we wanted to, and then that turn that Shauna was just talking about, I think they rebuilt it five or six times to get the inspector to have it. It was like three times. Three times. They had to rebuild it three times to get that turn just right. Just right. When we originally designed it, we were thinking of an old house where you know the stairs might completely V in and then 
you know, shift out. But apparently, people like to step on the very narrow corners, so you have to have that four inches. Which I'm glad it's safe, but it's not stuff you think about when you're, you know, just throwing in design ideas. So it was that, and then we had to make sure that there was enough space that we could still have the entryway the way we wanted it to be and still be able to access other rooms of the house without it closing off entryways. So that was something else we were considering. We had to consider early on because you're looking at the bones of your home. So you've got to be able to place those things at that time. In addition to that, you've got to think about where you want your plumbing and what kind of plumbing you're going to be wanting. And then electrical stuff, you've got to be start thinking about all of those things whenever you're looking at the bare bones because you don't want to have to go into the walls later to complete any of that and when you're running things like new HVAC you can't you have to do it then you have to do it ahead of time yeah the HVAC is actually a part of the dry-in process yeah. so they'll rough in they'll rough in the HVAC so they're putting in put holes where the air handlers are they put holes in and go ahead and run the, the vents to those holes so if you are doing this and you're running HVAC make sure that where they put the vent locations that they put a cap because they'll typically put like a piece of wood over it until you're ready for like your floors and the, the actual vent itself. Up until then they'll put a piece of wood. Something we had an issue with is they would put larger pieces of wood as caps than is the space for the vent. So keep an eye on that. Please. Yeah, the vent, the, the caps that they put on there are sealed and they remain sealed until they come back to do the final on the HVAC, which is after everything else has been done and no dust can get down into the, the vents. But those caps should be cut to the size of a vent. And we had a couple of rooms in our house where it was cut a little big. That was definitely surprise. This is a surprise. A later surprise that we will get to, but um, at this point in the project, I would definitely make sure that those caps that are basically gluing in place are done correctly. Mm -hmm. With the siding of the house, we had a couple different options. We could have, if we kept the old wood siding that was on here. I really wanted to keep the wood just because I, I get attached to the older elements and the, the traditional elements of the home that you come across in these older houses. So I was really attached to the wood. I didn't want to get rid of it. But whenever we were speaking with our, um, the engineer and the contractor, they brought up some very good points about fire stops and the cost of insulating and then the, with the older wood and as well, the concern of the air and water concern that they had because it wasn't going to be Tyvexed. That was the big issue was the fire and safety and health concerns with the way it would have been so hodgepodge we wouldn't have been able to properly tie back it tie back it tie back tie back whatever tie back. Tie whatever that is <laughs> that stuff we wouldn't have been able to properly do that it would have been like in patches and then the other alternative would have been to leave the old siding and wrap the whole thing and then lay siding on top of it that which makes no sense at all had to we next it. If you are restoring an old house, it's easier to keep the boards on the inside of the walls and then rip off the siding on the outside because you can do your insulation, then put up the plywood, then you know, wrap it with Tyvek, and then put on new siding because your protection to the house is everything on that exterior that you're doing. Um, with it being backwards for us and nowhere, you know, I mean, we had see through spots of our house because there was no siding there and there was no interior. Uh, it was a little bit more difficult, so. We basically just had studs to work with. Yep, and brick. Studs. Um, didn't. With that exterior, uh, and this is another important part that you don't think of during dry-in, but it came up, is these older homes are framed so that the the side uh, framing actually goes down in below the floor, and then the boards for the floor were laid up to it. When that happens, mice and other animals can crawl up inside your walls. And so they started building the floors out and then framing on top. Well, we couldn't change the, the framing of the entire house to accommodate that type of situation. We ran the sub floors up to the walls and then we had to go around the exterior walls and cut two by fours and fill in that gap everywhere so to, to attempt to keep 
the mice. It also helps to airlock the the house. Firebox. And firebox. So that's kind of an important factor when you're dealing with an older house. You need to figure out a way to go underneath the house. You could probably do it by crawling around underneath your house and doing it from the inner side as well. We did it from the top side because it was opened up. You need to figure out a way to seal that off, keep the air drafts from coming up. If, if the house caught on fire with it being able to suck air in through the bottom, it would just be one heck of a bonfire. So, that yeah, that would be sad. And then they have to fire cock everything. Every that was something we got called on actually, wasn't it? They didn't fire cock enough places. Yeah. Whatever it came time for drying an inspection, that was an area that we got um, delayed while we were delayed. Part of waterproofing your house and getting it dried in is actually waterproofing the foundation. It's part of the dry in process and we had had some water issues with our house. Somehow water was seeping in underneath the house and then it was like filling up in the back. What are you going to do about all that water? We can go fishing. You go fishing? Yeah. What do you think of catch? I will catch a big shark. Oh. Big shark, huh? Yeah. So waterproofing the foundation was uh, a pretty essential task. I didn't realize grading had such a impact on it. It makes sense because the flow of the land, but I didn't realize that grading was considered an element of waterproofing. As a remedy, we uh, they brought up doing French drain system because we don't have gutters on the home. So that was something that they did when they were doing the grading and uh, the spraying of the cement and, or painting, whatever it is. Yeah, the waterproofing of the actual footer yeah. and then the French drains. And then the grading. Yeah, it takes care of it. So in the midst of all of the hustle and bustle and projects that we had going on, as well as our own daytime jobs and kiddos, uh, we had some family come to visit and uh, decided to do a little glamping, glamping alongside us. So we had some extra hands to help us, which we were very thankful for. And uh, we got to do some fun little random projects like building a seesaw and uh, you know having bonfires. So that was a added plus to having our own land and space is that we could have family come and visit and hang out with us. We had like a family glamping compound yeah. with multiple campers and <laughs> uh, nightly bonfires. Mm -hmm. And we have a neighbor who loves fireworks, so across the uh, pasture you could randomly see a bunch of fireworks being set up. So That's it was cool. quite the little experience. I love glamping. <laughs>
our entire well, which probably had to be done anyway. We, we were able to put in a much bigger expansion tank, which we wanted. I got this, uh, it's an 86 gallon tank for, uh, from Tractor Supply. I didn't want that, I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about it. That's As you can see, this is a very big, bulky tank. I wanted a bigger expansion tank because I'm hoping that the larger tank will give us a lot more water pressure going out into our fields and other places. And you get a lot more pressure with uh, those big agricultural expansion tanks versus the typical household tank. Plus, our house is like 150 feet away from the well, so we really wanted to make sure that we had the correct amount of pressure going in the lines. So we were going to use the agricultural well we just, by putting in that bigger tank and really utilizing the space in that larger well house, it, it picked up the pressure for us, so. Now, one of the other elements that we could salvage and attempt to refurbish in the home were the original old wood doors, the interior doors and framing. The framing wasn't as salvageable as we had hoped because of some paint issues, but the doors, we took one by one over to the barn of sorts that we had. I started just scraping away and I tried a slew of different things. I tried paint thinners, enamel eaters, um, scrapers, heat, uh, guns, all sorts of like the heat guns, um, all sorts of things. And uh, that was some of the projects that I could do in my spare time whenever everyone else was hacking away at this house. So and then we also had to figure out the windows. Uh, we couldn't salvage some of the original windows. A lot of them were rotted out. We would have had to go out and find other windows, which... It just wasn't cost effective and it wasn't feasible for our time frame to keep them, which I would have liked to do. But we did actually hang on to the ones that were in one piece still and we are using them for little projects throughout the home and uh, we'll continue to do things like that. One of the things that we wanted to make sure that we were doing because we were putting a lot of money into the house is we wanted to stick as close to quality as we possibly could on the windows. We, well, we put more emphasis on the quality of window. The windows that we went with actually have a wood interior and then they have a metal exterior versus an all vinyl window because the wood interior allows us to kind of... Customize it. Customize it and create a feel that the older wood windows would have had with the house, even though they are new windows. That was an important element to me. Um, and it had the color I wanted. And it, yeah, the color that she wanted. Which, the color of the windows was picked kind of in line with the color of the roof. Yeah. We had initially talked about trying to scrape the roof, reseal it, and paint it. But they put some kind of mucky, I don't know if it was like a tar or paint or, you know, whatever previous in past decades, people will just kind of repaint a tin roof to keep it going. It was just in such a mess and disarray that the actual cost of repairing the existing roof was comparable to actually getting a brand new roof. So there was a like, $2,000 difference. But in the grand scheme of things, when you're considering how far or how close down the road you'd have to be making additional repairs to your roof, it's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, it was a much better idea to go with the new roof. And the new roof we were able to buy in the color that we wanted so it matches the windows. Mm -hmm. it, and it looks pretty. It, it looks pretty. Where we expanded out the, the back of our house, <laughs> so you couldn't use a metal roof because of the, the angle. The pitch was very semi-flat. Semi it wasn't completely flat, but it was a very minimal angle, so it just, yeah. it wasn't a recommended pitch from the manufacturer, so. So that section was actually done with, with a rubber. Just to, We're going to do solar panels right there. Just. We're going to have solar panels all over this farm when no. we're done with it. We're going to be 100% off-grid. Well, hopefully someday, but not... Well. Uh, the other thing we did when we were in this phase is we planned the expansion of the home. When you have everything opened up, you might as well go ahead and put the framing in for what you may want. We have windows on the side of the house up front, which are good expansion points because they're in common areas of the house. So you can take it out and do another uh, living room whatever. or sunroom, whatever you want to. 
maybe you'd do a wraparound porch on the house. That was the original plan, was a wraparound porch. Yeah, we actually framed in the, the headers for, for double door, uh, French door openings or encased like openings. That, yeah. And then we framed the windows in underneath that. We also kind of have a, a blank slate with the front door because before it was a single door and with everything opened up, we were able to put in a bigger header there, which allowed us to put in a larger door. More elaborate and ornate. Yeah, which we we found a door that was actually a wood exterior door because it's underneath a porch roof. And we liked the fact that it's wood and we were able to stain it so it kind of uh, fit in with the older home versus some of the new vinyl or steel doors that you see. Our door is actual wood. It, it fits with the period of the house, even though it is a more modern looking door. Um, it's just the weight and the quality. It, it We got it at a very, very reasonable price. Like. You look at the door and you would not have any idea how much we actually paid for it. Shauna is amazing <laughs> at going online and finding deals. I found the door, but on a regular basis, she finds all of our deals. Because of the amount of money that we were putting into the house, we decided to take what we had labeled as storage and actually turn it into living space so that... Well, rough in living space, but we're actually going to do much of anything beyond drywall it in. Drywall it in and make sure that the floor was sound. That's that was pretty much where we were going to leave it. And that was gonna be an ongoing project once we got in the house to just kind of hack away at other than the other things. But we went ahead and put in uh, one of the windows upstairs now just so that we couldn't because it, it became kind of a tricky space where it was gonna be roughed in is the inspector going to require it to have a fire exit or not? We, we weren't sure, so we wanted to make sure that it was just... Yeah, better do that now than later. But that also turned out to be a huge blessing for us because we did need the extra living space. Yes. When you're living in a small space with your newly married spouse and you are blending a family and you have dogs and construction and all these other elements, you're bound to be a little bit moody or a little bit, you know, you have days and moments where you're just unsure of things. And uh, I was having, I don't want to say a nervous breakdown, but I was like very emotional. And so um, <laughs> around Valentine's Day, I decided to, to break the news to uh, Charlie and our other kiddos that we were going to be adding one to our family that created a bit of a sigh of relief as far as the I knew where the emotions levels. were coming from <laughs> but um, it also created another sense of holy moly anxiety because we're in the middle of building a house that isn't prepared to handle another human being so we had to create some quick modifications and call our contractor and turn the upper space into a potential living space for a, um, another little creation. So luckily it was right at the point where we were We, we had missed out on that window of opportunity barely. to go ahead and frame out a bedroom upstairs. But Yeah, so they got a nice little Valentine's Day surprise. I think every girl's fear when it, agreeing to go glamping or living in a camper or trailer or whatever while building a home you always have that in the back of your mind is this going to be forever <laughs> how long is this going to take you know i mean i think everybody has that maybe it's not just girls guys do well i i kind of knew that the clock would be ticking but it's gonna stop every now and then because i had done a lot of construction projects and i hadn't done any like and the most i've done is let me refinish this desk you know or it was so it was not life altering. This project was pretty big though, so when the, the clock stopped, it was literally for a larger period of time because there was a, more moving parts. A, a bigger issue that we had to solve. Yeah. Um, but whenever this happened, whenever we found out we were expecting a little one, it was yeah. like TikTok, it's, it's we're baking. So it was time to really get moving. So, so we moved. <laughs>